exist. And when it has uh, the third party in, in, in the... On the whole, uh, it um, operated best with either a band or a, an improvising group uh, alone, when indeed with an improvising group, or a performer who wants to improvise and use the thing as an instrument. I, I regarded it as an extended musical instrument, mm -hmm. or extended mm -hmm. light musical instrument. It mm -hmm. was called Musical or something. Uh, not a particularly happy name, but it, I regarded it as an instrument to give performers, and to enable them to do what they do if they improvise alone, or to enable them to do and to amplify what they do when they're in contact with people who have a rapport with them. In a ballroom dancing thing, for example, a situation like the big band, at the, which is just pre-rehearsed and pre-cued even at Locarno, uh, it was no use, there was no effect at all on, on the dancers. Nor indeed was there any but an interest effect on an audience in a theatre. It was okay for one night, it was interesting to see with a good performer, but it was not a, a great success for people who did not, in some sense, participate, however indirectly, as they do in a dance hall with an improvising band, with a pop group, which is a good one. Uh, as against a, well, it depends your criteria of good, but one of my criteria there is that somehow there's a reaction to people around and at least some of them are, are, are taking this up and modifying the performance so it ain't the same every night. Mm -hmm. um, if you had a, an individual musician who again didn't want to use it, that it wasn't much use, it just produced colours. I guess the performer would close the eyes, he or she would simply close their eyes or something, or essentially do so. And uh, it's always possible. Um, it would have been an infernal nuisance otherwise, unless you wanted to use it. Um, what sense of time do people have on these? Well, for good, I say good in that criterion, very special criterion of good, because, I mean, good concert pianists are wonderful, good bands at the rehearsal are wonderful, in a different way. Uh, with performers who got involved with it, you've got a very curious uh, time sense. I had a, an installation at the Bolton's, which is now the Paris Pullman, you know the place in, in, in uh, just by the Forum in Chelsea, or North South Ken marginally. Uh, and um, there we had rather a disaster with a show called Moon Music, which consisted of a puppet show attached to some bizarre moving scenery. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it was meant to, it was, Moon had not in those days been seriously contemplated except by Cuban band. And uh, it was meant to be some sort of adventure thing about this. And it might have been quite a good show, excepting that our stage manager went mad, went off to Portugal carrying a canary cage containing a pair of socks. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, and driving the wrong way around Trafalgar Square several times beforehand. <laughs> And busy with it. <laughs> never be able to forget that anecdote. He also <laughs> broke. <laughs> he, he, he also insisted on knowing how puppet stages went up four foot six puppets, and you put a bridge across them, a gantry across them. He put this, had this thing put up in scaffolding in the wrong place. I said, it's in the wrong place. <laughs> well, these guys are working the puppets, so they don't like it. Do you want me to know all about puppets? You see, yes, I do. Ah, but here's the secret. He produced a spanner. Produced a what? A spanner? spanner. <laughs> or a wrench? Yeah, wrench. <laughs> From moving the scaffolding, the gigantic gantry. <laughs> Though who use was going to do it, I don't know. Uh, anyhow, the, a, rather, a rather interesting incident occurred after this disaster. We kept the thing on as, as a concert performance and very low audiences for a few nights. And uh, performers used to stay along and there was one flautist uh, I think he's the case of the largest distortion in time sense. Um, that he expected to get, I think, the last train back, the last tube back, which goes somewhere around midnight, see. And um, discovered him there at 6.30 in the morning, and it was 
he was carrying on tootling away. <laughs> And uh, I sort of tapped him on the shoulder and said, don't interfere with me. I, I said, wouldn't you like to get out of the theatre before it's illegal? <laughs> and he had absolutely no idea of, of, the, of the time duration. Joe also, I mean, I know well enough to be able to take a report from, uh, reported the same kind of phenomenon on a, a much lesser scale because she was very accustomed to the instrument. And, um, but you do get a shift. This reminds me very much of what it's like to chat to someone that you know very intimately and all of a sudden you look at your watch and it's five hours later. What Ooh. is it about language or about this kind of interactive language that is similar in that it distorts time in that way? How is it that both this device that you describe and a discussion with a close friend is the same? I, uh, Paul, I wouldn't use the term distort. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't use the term distort. All right. Uh, let me just just uh, throw something out here on the table in terms of orthodox theology that also I'd like to talk with you, Gregory, sometime in terms of physics. The Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey mm -hmm. I say? Gregory, sorry. I was thinking of Gregory of Nyssa. Um, <laughs> um, Different person altogether. No doubt. The, and the reason I say I think you have to be cautious about using the word distort is that time it's postulate that time itself is a distortion of a greater reality and that what is happening here is actually a uh, a re a, a, a reintegration of something that should always be and that what we perceive as time is actually the distortion and the reference to orthodox theology is that um, in orthodoxy you postulate some state of being of ontology of essence mm -hmm. and of Let's not get into a discussion of what is it that happened that is characterized as, quote, the fall. But one of the results of the fall is not only a, dis a distortion on the part of human beings' ability to perceive reality or to make proper judgments. It doesn't go away. I mean, there's a big difference here between Orthodox theology and Roman Catholic theology. Mm -hmm. But the time itself is one of the results of a, quote, fallen nature. Because it's being aware. It's right. being outside watching. So that, so that for what it's worth, I think you have to be very careful to postulate a distortion. Sure. It may yeah. be some sort of, what, what uh, Gordon may be making possible here, um, is some sort of, and this is where I was thinking of Gregory of Nyssa, and he, he talks about from glory to glory, you reach what poets or mystics call a quote exalted state, mm -hmm. which is actually the way things should be. Yeah. Yes, you can reach an exalted state, and I tend to agree with this argument entirely, John. Uh, that uh, I, I think I might phrase it a little differently, and perhaps we can make an allusion now to uh, various jargons in this matter. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a jargon called from Ron Atkin. Uh, called the dimensionality of events, meaning strictly their dimension in an external algebra covering the covering the relational system which is under consideration. Um, but what happens is that you become aware of events which otherwise would appear to be unnoticed and if projected onto this degenerate image of time <coughs> in, is uh, frequently very lengthy. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a projection and the actual event has a much higher dimension than that. Now I think this is what was happening and um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you, you you get the same result in in social groups. I'm pretty sure you get the same result in ritual. My only other comment to your comment is that it can produce ecstasy. It can also lead to St. John of the Cross in the dark night of the soul. They are 
somewhat like the zero and the maximum variety, or vice versa, if you like. So some similarity here between. Well, again, <laughs> it, using the term ecstasy, in in the the what I think is the appropriate Greek sense, it is, or as, as we say in Russian, sumasoshol. Yeah. Out of your mind, gone out of it. Yes. A very free, you. Uh, the, yeah. the, 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 to my understanding, the proper definition of ecstasy is literally out of the senses. Correct, yes. The, the vulgar meaning of it is somehow, and, and the way it's commonly mm. used, yeah. is some sort of an orgiastic mm -hmm. uh, sensation. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. technically it means literally out, yes, out of, the... of the senses. I mean, it is what, again, John of the Cross would call yeah. passionless. Yes, yes. So there is some. So in the strict definition of ecstasy, then there is some sort of ecstatic process that may be taking place here. Yes. Sure. I mean, I, mm -hmm. the reprimand is well taken. The term distortion uh, mm -hmm. is a sort of baiting kind of thing. What I was really fascinated by is this association of the two incidents. In other words, in my mind, or it's like the four-hour car ride that takes half an hour if you're speaking mm -hmm. with someone. What is similar to language, or to social well, discourse, or to, to the interaction of that kind, which is like this interaction? Are you asking like me or? Interaction? No, I, I would like to ask you. Yes. Well, I mean, it, it, I mean, I don't want to. Can, I mean, you, yeah, you, I mean, you've said a little bit about events. I, I think I, that so I, I think now, but I didn't know then. I was um, I was surprised, intrigued, uh, convinced, not because it was repeatable in the ordinary sense. But because it occurred in people who I knew very well and uh, were much more reliable and selected subjects or something. I mean, that the, they weren't following instructions in an experiment or anything like that. And I have confidence in, in, in what they, their consensus over the matter. And uh, I really didn't understand this. I found it intriguing and set up another situation later much later on, which had similar properties. And um, I think what's happening actually is that you get into a condition where you have a genuine natural language, even though it isn't spoken. Uh, music itself indeed it has the properties of a natural language, and dance does, and some kind of movement do. But perhaps the novelty of this one is that, because they're all capable of conveying metaphor, addressing commands, the voices of a fugue are personalized in some sense. Um, so uh, I think in this case the novelty was not so much to produce a, a language, or a, if I'm allowed to call it a language for the moment, Tam, it's not a spoken language, obviously, but I guess you'd agree that music, for example, is a, a perfectly good language, and with the properties and power of a natural language, and um, unlike a formal language. And I think one was getting um, a new kind of natural language, which was now being used. Uh, so the same phenomenon, I do believe, occurs when we talk about having a private, esoteric language between ourselves. And I believe that it is, this is, is constructing in spoken terms, usually now, or gestural terms, uh, a private novel to use, natural language with certain powers and potentials, which uh, uh, could be expressed indeed in, in any other natural language, but are more readily expressed in this private language. This is what one means by a group having a private language or a family having a private language. At least, I guess it is. And uh, I think this thing had the property of creating such a thing, which once created was used. And it could be used even for talking to yourself. Now, whatever else you were doing, you weren't talking to this goddamn machine part of the town. You uh, may be talking to yourself, you may be talking to others through this load of equipment, uh, and vice versa. 
But I think one produced a conversation, and on some occasions, which still remain unpredictable, but certainly not unrecognizable in other situations, I'm not even sure that prediction is a, is a sensible aim. Forecasting would be. Um, the uh, apropos of especially social situations, I'm not at all sure that prediction in the ordinary sense is a proper in respect to, to many social and political situations. Forecasting surely is. Uh, it doesn't carry the overtones of prediction, which is a very special kind of forecasting. And uh, <clears throat> I think it is the production. It's the production, either inter or intra personally, of a useful private language, which is you. You think it's something about the experience, the specific experience of the language, the private language, the interaction, rather than just the experience of total involvement. I think, Deborah, it's both, because you are totally involved when using a private language, usually. Uh, but uh, I guess it also involves pretty total involvement, it entails pretty total involvement. Uh, but uh, the, the engine itself, I, I mean, I really want to emphasize this, the engine itself is simply a catalytic agent in this process. It is not somehow doing it magically. Uh, the magic arises in the situation. The magic does not arise in the gadget. The gadget is a catalyst to such magic. And that's what there is. I think there's something, you know, when you talk about the private language, it seems really, does seem crucial. I think in some sense, every language is a private language. You know, every person's set of associations with words I would agree with you. is unique, but yes. occasionally, you get the feeling that someone else's associations approximate yours. It's something like what... Um, well, you were talking earlier about talking shared about body of assumption, right, right. Paul, and I was agreeing with you entirely in what you said, that you had certain assumptions which had perhaps to be in common before you could communicate. Right, right, what well, we were talking about and, before, yeah. But then you have a certain body of shared assumptions which are particularly those you have grown and learn together, uh, and by recall and so forth, reminiscence. And uh, th th this is, is, uh, is, is very much the sort of thing which I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. So it, it may be that the fascination that the performer feels has something to do with figuring out the system mm. underlying mm. that machine's responses. Well, let me ask you. Yeah, we're just making a beautiful just, effect, uh, actually, usually, to just to make something which is in, in their aesthetic and acceptable usually to the audience aesthetic uh, or the dancer aesthetic uh, is uh, is a satisfactory. Let me ask this, um, just to press you on that, yeah. uh, coming out of your question, which mm -hmm. I don't think is fully answered. Really. No, not yet. Um, as to what are the what are the parallels between let me retrace what are the parallels between a conversation with a with a friend not in a private language necessarily which results in this uh, change in time sense and the features of this interaction with the machine that results in the time sense now into that I'd like to inject a couple of other questions which I think enrich the discussion there one is your comment uh, that the magic does not reside in the machine here okay. should be brought in a little more closely because when you say that the magic resides in the situation but not in the machine yeah. in the interaction, yeah. in the in interaction. interaction it's an interaction then uh, what's the difference between the machine and a conversational partner where the magic also may reside in the interaction or, because the machine will only contain reflection of yourself and isn't capable the brain is of or is only marginally capable of the kind of concurrency which would be required in order to juxtapose different perspectives unless it's given I'm, them. I'm thinking of your talking mm. about the machine being able to initiate yeah. a search for other kinds of variations. It can search, but its search is, it searches and all the rest of it, and it's a nice fancy catalytic molecule. Mm -hmm. And it's necessary to life of this kind, perhaps. 
but it doesn't in itself constitute life no, of this I'm kind. Not, I'm not. And the uh, reason I call the situation is that I think it is the interaction, literally. And of these interactions which we commonly engage in, sometimes one is particularly able to express some metaphor or idiom, some phrase, some idea, some explanation, whatever, which, uh, in which it, it, it's very facile to do so. And if these particular sorts of metaphor or explanation or whatever uh, are in mind, uh, then uh, it becomes trapping. And you also, of course, uh, see events which you wouldn't otherwise see. How, how did you know, how would you know when a real positive dialogue was going on? How could you discriminate between what was a good dialogue, in essence, and when the performer was ignoring it? I can't. I can only say if people enjoyed themselves. I mean, I wouldn't endeavor to say. That is why I said I thought prediction might be out of place. Mm -hmm. What I learned to do, and I must say intuitively, was to set things up in terms of displays and so on, such obvious things as covering the whole visual field easy, suitable intensity, etc., all the rest of it. So set things up in such a way that, as far as I can make out, uh, circumstances were propitious. And now all I'd say in any performance is that people enjoyed that before. Well. But there was there was no, in in fact, could there there could not be any way of determining from the observation of the performer and the machine whether or not the performer was finding this at uh, trapping. Only in the very crude way I've talked of, for example, loss of duration. So you asked the performer uh, what time he thinks it is. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So so what you, what you had in here was a situation where you in the favorable circumstances where the performer found the situation engrossing. Yeah. You had what would be half of a similar engrossing conversation between two, indi two individuals, you, both capable of, of... You have the record of it, uh, Jeffrey. You have the record of it, uh, and it happens that this record because it is, in fact, in terms of entrained oscillators, yes. is going to continue. So the record is not a, a written down record in a piece of storage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it is there, sure. Are there some physiological <coughs> examples I'm thinking of, or, or uh, even broader ecological examples, of uh, systems that you could describe as behaving in ways that this machine seems to represent? This entrainment to oscillators is an interesting idea that seems to be close to the language I've heard. Well, Grigory's work on the Larvin ritual is, is well known. To some extent, uh, transvestite ritual is an indicator. It was cracked up as being an example of negative feedback, as far as I recall it chiefly. <coughs> so was uh, Roy Rappaport's analysis of the Zimbaga. When you look a bit more closely at the Zimbaga, which is easy because in that community there are many, in, in New Guinea, uh, many tribes inhabiting regions of the forest. Uh, and the forest is pretty dense and was inaccessible until the Australian government with the best will in the world put a <laughs> highway through the middle of it, um, which I think it's settled down now again, I'm not sure, maybe you know. But uh, that disrupted things a bit with the best intentions in the world. Um, the ritual cycle there consists, as I recall it, in the planting of a rum beam, which is a kind of carrot in the ground, um, the establishment of a state in which a tribe has identity, or a group has identity, I forget what the technical term is, a collection of Zimbaga have identity, a period in which the uh, pig herd, which at this stage is virtually zero, but is reproductive, is allowed to grow. Uh, apart from the supply of occasional high-grade protein, the pigs are used as agricultural instruments. At a certain point, uh, the particular area of forest, and the forest is more or less mapped out into geographically viable areas, and some parts are unpassable, 
and the whole damn thing's on a couple of great valleys. Uh, and there are about 35 tribes, or groups, as I recall it. And um, the pigs uh, root in the undergrowth and render the, the, the clearings of the forest surrounding a village, which is essentially erected, by those people with whom you have planted the rumbi, which is your extended family. Uh, your, your try whatever extended family is perhaps the best way of describing it um, you also have friends and uh, allies in some sense and some enemies in some sense this however will emerge in the course of the debate or description uh, at this point uh, when the pig herd the domesticated wild pig herd, which roots around in the gardens, has grown to a certain size, <coughs> they then begin to consume the vegetables uh, intended for uh, human consumption, so that instead of pigs helping to keep human beings, human beings are keeping pigs. At this point, the ladies perhaps do all the work in, in the Zimbabwe society, they do every piece of rough manual work, I don't know why it is, talk about sexual discrimination, I've never seen anything like it, and they have to do anything laborious uh, or unpleasant or as well as bearing children and doing the rest, and um, anything at all taxing on the wits for that matter, well, apart from sitting in council chamber, it's not very taxing, and um, they make a wailing noise, which is unworthy, quite really, this, this, this gives rise to the erection of a ceremonial fence across which, uh, in two stages in fact, the pig horde is slaughtered uh, and the meat is salted and distributed across uh, the fence. The fence rots and a state of trade sets in when there is a ritual war. It's like deers with antlers clashing, territorial type. It's a, it's a ritual war. Nobody gets killed and axed, or, you know, like after Hamlet or whatever it was. But <laughs> the it's sort of deliberate annihilation. And uh, at this stage, the tribes have resorted. Now, looked at in this cyclic form, the cycle is rather like the Navan cycle. It is a feedback regulator which is interpreted symbolically because all of the rum beam has enormous symbolic significance, the fence which rots away has and so forth. The interesting thing is how tribes started to exist in the first place and how there were people to pass the meat to and give gifts to the friends. And that of course is because the tribes are resorted. So the tribe or extended family to which you belong depends upon obvious geographical and environmental ecological factors uh, and uh, also upon just a reassortment due to the limited trade and message carrying that goes on and it's this feedback which I think is coalescence to make the Zambaga as a nation say rather than an extended family it's that's the interesting part not just the feedback mm -hmm. and the really intriguing bit of the thing is is this that without that feedback cycle there wouldn't be any Zimbabwe it's not just that there wouldn't be a tribe which was viable in, in that uh, living in a viable neighborhood uh, getting enough protein and getting enough vegetables etc uh, it would, there wouldn't be a Zimbabwe, the culture wouldn't exist. Now I believe that process, that changeover process, uh, is perhaps the thing to focus upon. Because the Zimbabwe as a nation become an organization because of that, and within that nation there may exist extended families that are also organizations, and Roy's main emphasis on naturally the he writes this learned book which is called Pigs for the Ancestors and devotes but an appendix to it but at the 
But again, he presented a paper which has always impressed me, impressed Stafford Beer immensely, it impressed me immensely, uh, certainly impressed Gregory immensely. He's a student, I think, of Gregory's. And um, he uh, gave this paper, which was not the social anthropology book or, or social and physical anthropology book, which is very learned and so on. But uh, he was stressing the feedback loop and trying to make this point, which at that stage, which was in 1961, I believe, just didn't get over. But, uh, well, it got over to only a few of us. And uh, I did ask him shortly afterwards if that was a correct interpretation, whether I was misrepresenting him in, in saying, saying such things. That, Although I found the mechanism a little bit ineluctable, it was somehow a very beautiful example of how cultures and languages are created, and within them there may live coexistent, partly autonomous units, which occasionally communicate. And in fact, the whole thing is a sort of, in those days I didn't have the word, gigantic conversation, which reaches high points when somehow the selection is right. Uh, balance of the human and the ecological factors is right. I think that here we have a, an enormous bridge between between language and cultural organization and this underlies a lot of debate now in architecture about what is architecture. Um, I mean is a cardboard box architecture? Uh, is an airplane architecture? Well it should be. Um, we have naval architects but putting a building up isn't just putting a shelter up. I mean, sure, it has to shelter, just like the terrain in the Zimbabwe neighborhood in New Guinea has to maintain uh, the viability of some living organisms. But uh, that's not much of a building. And it's perfectly obvious if you look at the pieces of artwork and so forth that are done, that there are peaks then there is indeed, in the general sense, ecstasy. And in the specialized and abraded sense, peaks because ecstasy is meant to be one end of the spectrum and gloom the other. But in the Yorick sense of ecstasy, which is a proper one, John, uh, there are moments of ecstasy. And I believe that also is necessary to having a civilization, a culture. And I believe that language is a fantastically powerful instrument in this, that the, the important things and the interactions that go on, whether they be verbal or not, providing they're capable of conveying human qualities, and maybe even superhuman qualities, <laughs> the, such as poetry, for example. The description that you're just making of uh, gigantic conversation, uh, the, the description of a culture sounds a little bit without, I haven't pressed it through, but it sounds a little bit like a, des a description that might work for a cell, doesn't it? There's this organization with partly autonomous organizations within it that have occasional conversations and peaks and well, organs and whole yeah. cells. Yeah. Systems of organs communities and communities. Just put it behind it, if you would. You're applying the same model. Yeah. So what can we, to go back to the machine then, in that perspective, yeah. the question that, it, that, that is staying with me from our conversation is the one that the the problem of the endpoint of uh, this interaction between the, the, the performers, perhaps the dancers and the machine, that came down to the question of what makes the machine happy. And uh, how does this system operate? Why in some cases does it operate to have it have it turn off, in other words, it's happy being bored. In other cases, 
it proceed to uh, maximize variation or create perhaps a sustained long-term timeless interaction that continues to go on. Can I, can I really stress, Paul, that in my view, and unless you convince me otherwise, the machine, qua machine, and I confess that in this case it's not quite an algebraic machine, it's more liberal than one of those devices, cannot be happy or sad. Uh, the machine stands in relation to the Zimbabwe example very much the same way as a propitious piece of woodland, or in places propitious piece of woodland, and pigs, as against some other animal, stand in relation to the existence of the Zimbabwe. And perhaps, perhaps another way of saying it is the machine for a person or performer for whom the particular arrangement of the particular machine allows him to become engrossed with it so that he loses track of time in the example you've given. The machine is a is the uh, allows him to have a conversation between two different sorts of way in a manner which he's not normally capable of doing. As I say, he's not normally capable of genu generating a conversation between the way his hands move on his instrument and what he sees. Uh -huh. Normally, the only conversation his hands have with the rest of him is that his hands move on the instrument and he hears what he does uh -huh. and that is one conversation he has and he establishes that what he did with his hands is what he des desired to hear. Yeah. What is happening in this case is you provided a different way of him having a conversation with himself. That is to say his hands now have a conversation not only with his ears but with his eyes and he may look for a relate. he may have, he may try to establish not only a harmony with what his ears hear his hands doing, yeah. but he may try to investigate forms of music that not only are harmonious to his ear, but produce something that's harmonious to his eye. So he's establishing, the machine is merely establishing a new route for a conversation. Well, I think there are two features. One is the new route, the new mode. But if it was just a light show where the bass was red and... No, 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 no but it, no, it's a genuine conversation. That is to say, he, he, his, his hands may learn, may... As, n he may not really cause I'm it. I'm not sure it becomes a general, a general conversation until you have this other perspective, this thing which says, ah, you made it a little bit different, now I'm going to amplify that difference. In the same way that I say, wait a minute, the thing you just said contradicted what you said no, a minute no, ago. But, but, but you see, but that's, it's, it's a commentary. I don't think that's necessary. It's the that is to say, this I is, think it is. This is the particular manner in which the machine permitted a conversation. Mm -hmm. One could, it may be that this happens to permit uh, a fairly interesting conversation between his eyes and hands, so that a machine that did something rather different in taking the way the man played, the performer played, and producing a light show. That is to say, it is imaginable that any device which takes the output of the musician and produces a light show, no matter what it did in effect, could still be engrossing. That that's, is to say, right, but that's only part. I don't think that's the essential part. What I, I, th I think you need, I think you need, I think the other part is the essential part. The part which, whether or not in the same mode, makes a differentiation. It says, excuse me, let me give you a, a point of view on what you just stated, which you hadn't considered or hadn't imagined or didn't realize could exist. Are you, are you asserting that it, it, that is a necessary portion for any performer to have found the thing engrossing? No, no. No, no. I'm saying that's necessary for a conversation. Yeah. yeah. That's different. But let me change the terms again from that to, to go back. Cause I don't. I don't believe the machine can truly be happy. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. I wasn't suggesting no, I that. Mm -hmm. um, no, but what I was trying to focus you back on in this, or, or maybe for the first time, to develop in this whole discussion is the language in which you introduced the whole concept of the machine, which is that it looks for variation, but there's the possibility that it turns itself off in quote boredom or uh, a null case that there, there are two things going on here. Essentially, the, the move towards sameness in this interaction or the move towards variation, which may be very close to what you're talking about, which is the other point of view. And so... That must be basic. That, I think it is. I think it is. Now, I, you know, it, you know, that's I, the I feature think, of the so machine that is most interesting to me. And right that, now. I think, is the same thing that goes on in a conversation that's where what, what you're juggling is the interaction. That's what I want to explore a little bit. What yeah. you're juggling is to what extent are these two people the same? 
To what extent that be different? Absolutely. So and this is such when, a simple machine that it gives them a very simple model. interaction becomes exhilarating when somehow you're achieving sameness and difference and they all become one. That's right. That's right. It's like, you know, I'm writing a paper to myself and I don't see how stupid it is. I show it to Jeffrey and he says, well, wait a minute, this is contradicting what I said before. And I say, great, yes, I, <laughs> you know, and that's what the machine seems to be doing somehow. So it's both. So it's not just the engrossment. I could become so engrossed in my own writing that I'm just fascinated. Yes, but, but, the, but the query was, mm -hmm. to, to what extent is the engrossment that a performer has with this machine mm -hmm. like the engrossment in a conversation? And you're suggesting Good. that Good. you there make are, a further there. distinction yeah. between, so we say, uh, an engrossment that in retrospect the next morning you find to have been productive and an engrossment <laughs> which you might in retrospect Fair term under. You wouldn't say it's the same thing if you got some involved writing a paper that you suddenly realized it was 6.30 in the morning. Yes, I mean, but you could have done that. You could have been writing and driven. Agreed. Th there are both of the components. So what I'm saying is, yeah. is that, that the reason why it was engrossing mm -hmm. did not necessarily depend upon it being a productive one. I, I think the engrossment is still a function of how much I can differentiate for myself the enjoyment of carrying it through. No, but the question is, is what is it, did the machine did that allowed it to become engrossing to someone? Mm -hmm. In this case, the machine did rather a lot of things. Well, two things perhaps. basically, a change of mode and a differentiation. Or, yes. or, or, or a, but the question is, is that which, is, is it that which it made it possible to become engrossing? Or could a machine that was much less um, it was not an adaptive variation. It was not an adaptive variation. It can still yeah. become engrossing, mm -hmm. and I would suggest that you haven't d necessarily Maybe. demonstrated. It may be that the machine that existed was more likely to produce yeah. engrossment uh, and engage yeah. to, be, become, yeah. to become engaged with the machine. That you could become engaged with this one more mm -hmm. easily than mm -hmm. with another because mm -hmm. it had certain aspects. Right. But, but yeah. the two key but things. Doesn't seem to me, that doesn't seem to me to be the point. The point is that something is engaging, that you become engrossed in what is happening because it allows you to uh, develop some sort of additional perspective, some sort of additional thing. I think but yeah. you could do that with a, that might occur with an extremely primitive device. Well, that's that you're even much more primitive than this. Right. But, that it's not this one. I mean, for example, in the case, case of the culture, the land simply lying there, which draws rum beans and accommodates pigs, mm -hmm. is not a particularly responsive oh, thing. It, 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 it is, is a substrate. It, it is a substrate that allows rum beans to grow. If I have any light machine that responds to how I play, no matter how unadaptive or un unimaginative it is, yes. I may still become engaged with it. I may still, even even if it is a very dull response, even if it's even if it is very predictable what it is. Mm -hmm. That if I always, every time I utter a high note, it makes a red light. Mm -hmm. Okay, I could still become interested in can I compose a piece of music that produces what I find to be a pleasing light display to go with it. I may become engaged in that oh. act. So I don't think that, I mean, I think that, that, that you, this particular one may have been more engrossing than usual. Or a matter of fact, some people might find it less engrossing. But what would be the they, simplest machine? What would be the simplest machine that would have this feature of not just a change of mode as an engrossing quality? Wouldn't that depend but, on different people? But, I think it would depend on different people. I might find it extraordinarily irritating that it was responding in my variation. And I might find it extremely difficult to play a flute in such a way that my variations were what it responded to. But you said before. I may wish it to always put on a bright red light whenever I hit a high C. That may be which I wanted to do. And I'm now considering what kinds of music, what serial set of notes, coupled with a totally rigid response to the machine that high Cs are red, low, uh, a middle register A is light blue. Suppose that I finally discern that I still may wish to, to train the machine I certainly want to discover uh, a, a musical piece whose colors I find in some manner go together. So the machine could, have to, could, could, could merely be something that produces some visual output for some auditory input. Really any. I still might be able to find that engrossing. I'm, I'm not fascinated I'm by the idea that, that I might have a slightly different engrossment factor than you might. What I'm fascinated by is the presentation of an alternative perspective which has this boundary aspect to it where the boundary shift and we're separate and then we're the same but and so on I think it's that aspect and the event aspect of time 
which together are the link to natural yeah. language. Yeah. Well, and, and the reason that, why that, that may be the case. case. That may be the case. That, that, that this may have been more like natural language because it responds, yeah. it is designed to look for similarities I mean, and respond to variation. You know, kids in a playpen. But that's not the, the point that was originally addressed, which is what is it about the performer and this machine that allowed them to lose track of time? And I don't think it is necessarily the natural language, simil the similarities of this machine to a natural language conversation, which produce the ability to lose track of time. It is the the, the, the fact, no, no matter how much, I mean, what I'm saying is you lose track of time when on your side of the conversation you seem to be having a conversation, mm -hmm. not whether on the other side, whether in the machine, what mm -hmm. the machine is doing is like having a conversation, that's not necessary. Mm -hmm. This machine may have been better at it because on its side it was doing things.